Many of us here today have probably floated down a creek sometime in your life. Maybe in a canoe or in an inner tube or kayak. You know, you need to do little but relax and drift. It's the nice part about it. It takes little effort to drift. But drifting can be dangerous if you are not paying attention. You know, you can come upon a, a, a swift current around rocks or even a falls. I remember probably at least 35, 36, 37 years ago, back when I was helping Dad insulate houses, we were we had got far ahead and the people that was working were, were behind, so we decided we would go down on uh, Sugar Creek and float for a while. And so we were floating down for a while and all of a sudden we came to a falls on it that we didn't even know was there. We weren't paying attention. So we had to hurriedly get to the side and the bank and get our canoe and haul it down and then put it back in. So, drifting can be dangerous. But the danger of drifting I'm talking about this morning is not limited to the physical world. I want us to look and have as our main text today, Hebrews chapter 2, the first three verses. Because we're going to see that Christians can drift spiritually to their destruction if they're not careful. And this is a lesson we all need regardless of our age or, or anything else. It's an important thing to consider. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 2 beginning in verse 1. The writer says, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? See, there's some danger in drifting. It can happen if we don't pay close attention to what God has said. The word drift here comes from a word that means to flow past, to glide by without giving heed to what's happening around. It's like you're in that canoe and you're going down the, the creek and you're not paying any attention to what's happening in front of you or to the side of you. You just kind of lay back and your eyes are closed. Drifting means going with the flow and often that is very dangerous. Back when Paul wrote Romans chapter 12, he talked about going with the flow. In Romans chapter 12, the first two verses, Paul talks about drifting and how drifting is going with the flow. Romans 2 verse 1. <clears throat> Paul writes, I beseech you, okay, I urge you, I implore you, I plead with you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Don't be conformed to this world. That's what going with the flow means. And the world wants you to be like them. You know, our culture and our society wants you to be just like them. Do what they do. Paul says, don't do it. Don't give in. See, drifting and being conformed means you're not rowing, you're not paddling, you're not steering. You're just letting yourself go. You're not trying at all. And it is very dangerous. It usually occurs gradually. You know, you just drift a little bit, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. Sometimes entire congregations can drift away. Some can do it slowly, some can do it quickly. Remember when Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia? He said, I'm amazed that you were so quickly removing from the gospel. I think it's Galatians 1.6. 
So entire congregations can drift away. I know congregations that I grew up knowing that have over time drifted away. It didn't happen quickly in most cases. They did one thing and then they did another thing and another thing and after a while they were totally off course. And that can happen to people. That can happen to us if we're not paying attention. One little thing and then another thing, and another thing, and another thing. And then we end up being entirely off course. One error leads to another error, leads to another error. This is very serious. Very, very serious. Sometimes it can occur due to a lack of attention. Maybe we just weren't really watching and you realize after a while, wow, look how far off course I am. Maybe just carelessness. Or maybe neglect. And, and, and you find out after a while, wow, look, look how far we have drifted off. I want us to read Hebrews chapter 5 now for a minute. Verses 11 through 14. Hebrews 5, verse 11, I'm sorry, verse 12 through verse 14. That's for, both, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk, not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are at full age, those who are mature. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. I like the, the English Standard Version here says, by constant practice. See, that's how we keep from drifting, by constant practice. We're, we're always watching, we're always looking we're always trying to see. That's what we need to do. So drifting may occur because Christians become so busy with the affairs of this world that they just don't have time to steer the course anymore. You know, John warned about this in 1 John chapter 2. Do not love the world or the things of the world. And he talked about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. He said those things are passing away. There's a lot of dangers involved in drifting. So how do I know? Are there red flags? You know, what kind of signs are there that I may be drifting? So I want to examine myself to make sure I am not going off course. One thing that might be happening is your conscience doesn't bother you much anymore when you do something wrong. When you put other things before worship. When you put other things before doing what's right. When you put other things before your Christian life. And, and so your conscience is not doesn't bother you anymore. That's a red flag. You know, that's a flag that's going off. That's saying something is not right here. You need to be careful. You know, when you go to the... Uh, Beach these days, they have different flags they put up to give you certain warnings about things. Maybe riptides or, or certain types of sea creatures have been seen or whatever. And those flags <coughs> are warnings. So that when you go to the beach, you know what may happen if you get into the water. These are the type of things we're looking for. Another red flag, another sign you may be going off course is you don't study God's Word near like you used to. One of the greatest verses in the Bible about this, I think, is the very first verse of the first psalm. Psalm 1, verse 1.
<clears throat> it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Notice the, the progression. Walking, and then standing, and then sitting. See how the person is drifting? But notice verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law, in his law he meditates day and night. I love this word meditates here because when I looked it up, it has the same idea as what a cow does. Those of you who have been raised with cows, they ruminate their food, which means they eat it, goes into the stomach for a while, comes back up. They eat it again, goes into the stomach, comes back up. I hope I'm not making my stick, but that's what happens. And they do this over and over and over again. And the reason they do that is so they can get the most out of that food, grass, that they're eating. That's what the psalmist says you need to do with God's Word. You need to eat it, ponder it, think about it a while, bring it back, read it again, study it, ponder it for a while, do it over and over and over again so that you can get out of it what God wants you to get out of it. The Bible provides direction for living a useful life. You know, it's sad, but so many people in our world never live a useful life. They don't do anything useful with their life at all. But the Bible gives us direction. It gives us instruction. If we meditate on it and ponder it, it, it gives us direction about how to live. What happens... You know, how we should respond to circumstances and what, what, what should we do when someone says this to us. The Bible gives us all of those answers if we've ruminated. If we've really pondered it and, and, and thought about it. It gives us those answers. So are we really pondering God's Word? Another red flag Simply might be you don't desire to be with God's people as much as you used to. You know, the psalmist said, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said, let us go be with God's people. That's what that verse means. We don't have the conviction maybe we used to have. We spend more time with non-Christian friends than we do with God's people. The prophet Hosea Remember, he's the first of the so-called minor prophets. <clears throat> right after Daniel, Hosea says this in Hosea 7, 8, and 9. And I think it depicts what we're talking about pretty well. Hosea 7, verses 8 and 9. Verse 8 of the 7th chapter says, Ephraim has mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake unturned. Aliens have devoured his strength, but he does not know it. Yes, gray hairs are here and there on him, yet he does not know it. Of course, he's trying to describe what has happened to God's people here. And he says in one way, they're like a cake that's not turned. One side's done, the other side's raw. What's it good for? Nothing to be thrown away. That's what he's saying about God's people. Not worth eating, not worth having. Why? Because he's mixed with other people. He's gotten away from God. Aliens have devoured his strength. So he's allowed ungodly people to influence him to the point where he's not of any use anymore. Just like that cake, not turned. Christian fellowship is is critical for God's people. It's critical. In, in the Hebrew writer, again, we'll go back to Hebrews, this time the third chapter. And in the third chapter, verse 13, <clears throat> this is what the writer says Christians need to do for one another. Hebrews 3, verse 13. 
but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Have you, do you know any Christians who's been, who now become hardened through sin? I do. And it's sad. What are we supposed to do for one another? Urge, exhort, plead, encourage every day. And that helps us not be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Another red flag might be you just don't pray much anymore. You know, Jesus taught the, the need to pray. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. He said, you need to pray. It's important. Don't give up on praying. It's an important verse. But if you don't pray much anymore, that might be a sign you are drifting away. You're not steering the course. You're headed for the rocks. You're headed for the fall. Another possible red flag is you just don't really have much desire anymore to talk about spiritual things. You, you don't really care much about sharing the gospel with anyone or, or talking to people about uh, the church or about Christ. You just don't care much. You know, one of the things that Paul uh, said was so wonderful about the church at Thessalonica was about their faith and how it had been spread throughout the world. How did it spread? People talked about it. How wonderful it was. And of course we have the best news of anybody in the world. Another red flag might be that the things of the world are more important, more valuable than the things of God. You get more excited, more emotional about sports or hobbies or entertainment or anything other than things of God. Of course, they can, this can apply to, to parents and their children. It can apply to everybody. What are we most concerned about? So how do I stop it? If I find myself off course... If I find myself drifting, if I find myself not paying attention, how do I stop drifting? Well, one thing Peter told us is found in 2 Peter chapter 1. Maybe the most important. 2 Peter 1, and he mentions it twice in that chapter. First of all, he mentions it in chapter 1 verse 5. Peter says, but also for this very reason, and the reason was because of all those wonderful promises that they could be partakers of the divine nature, that they escaped the corruption. So he says, for this reason, giving all diligence. It takes diligence, which means it takes effort not to drift away. It takes effort to pay attention. It takes effort to not neglect the things that are important. <clears throat> Which means never stop rowing. You know, keep on the, the straight and narrow. Don't start to drift away because, just like we mentioned, if you drift a little bit, then it's easier to drift more and drift more. Press on. This is what Paul said. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Paul said, you've got to press on. You've got to be diligent. You've got to work at it. Verse 12 of Philippians 3 says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended the one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Nobody will be in heaven who drifted there. You cannot drift into heaven. Like Paul says, you've got to press on. 
Peter says, you've got to be diligent. Well, Peter said, still in 2 Peter 1, this time in chapter 2, verse 10, Peter says this, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. You will never go off course. You will never drift away. What do you have to do? Be diligent. Be diligent. You cannot retire from the Christian life. You can. Christian life takes diligence. How do I stop drifting? Another thing I have to be aware of be on guard against hidden obstacles. Watch out for those rocks. Watch out for the falls. Because they are there. This time, in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, talks about some of those rocks to avoid. 1 Peter 2, verse 11 says, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. There's some rocks to avoid there. Fleshly lust. And of course our society is overran with fleshly lust. Everywhere you look. Fleshly lust. TV, movies, radio, the internet, whatever. Fleshly lust are out there everywhere. Things of the flesh. And he says, they are warring against the soul. They're trying to overturn your canoe. They're trying to destroy it. That's what they want to do. So, any type of lust or false teaching. False teaching can cause your boat to overturn. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul warned that that can lead us into the rocks. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. We kind of get the idea of being on a boat and it being rocked. Verse 14 of the fourth chapter of Ephesians says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Tossed about. What's tossing it about? False teaching. False teaching can <clears throat> carry people away. I know so many people that used to be just so faithful. But false teaching has led them completely away from the faith. Totally away. Their boat was, was uh, tossed as Paul says, to and fro, it was carried about with every wind of doctrine. What happened? They weren't as anchored to God and His Word as they should have been. They weren't anchored. And so this false teaching carried them away. I, I know so many people that have been carried away like that. And it is, it is so sad to see how they drifted away. Because at one time they were so, so faithful and dedicated to the cause of Christ. And then some teaching just kind of wrapped themselves around that person. And you might say drug them under the water. And it's sad to see. One more time, we're going to read our text. Hebrews chapter 2. Beginning in verse 1, he says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. What do I need to do? Listen to the things we've heard. Listen to God's word. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and it did, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, and it did, how shall we escape? If we neglect, so great a salvation. 
which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So great is salvation. That's the salvation we have. It is great. It's great in extent. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's great in duration. It's going to last till the end of time. It's great in the price that was paid. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 26. This is the blood of my covenant. It was given for you. That was the price. And of course the reward is an inheritance that is incorruptible and that is kept for me and you in heaven. So what do I need to do? I need to give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. You know, God's people used to be called walking Bibles. Where some people may have taken that as a, as a detriment, but I took it as something, as a compliment. Because that's what we need to be. Not just know God's Word, but heed it and follow it. Because it tells us how to have a useful life. This morning, David's chosen an invitation song for the purpose of helping us think if I need to respond to that invitation. And if you do, I encourage you not to wait, but come as we stand and sing.